reporting for the flight to Planet E. Planet E. Planet E. Planet E. Planet E. All right, what's going on, everyone? We are back again for another episode of Between Two Turntables and a Microphone. It's been a minute, but uh, we're back and making this happen. And we got a very special guest tonight by the name of DJ Huda Hudia, or DJ Huda Hudia, as I've heard some people in the Far East say. So we'll get that figured out as we get through the interview. But what's going on, man? Thank you for taking the time out to do this. I have been looking forward to this for a long time, ever since Rob told me, and it's, I'm glad it's finally happening. Yeah, I know, Patrick. Thank you so much all the time. Everything that you know, you've helped me out with, so I appreciate it. So, looking forward to this. Yeah, man, it's going to be awesome. We're going to cover some uh, some good stuff, and to start, we'll just kind of talk about the Global Breaks Festival. What's going on with that? And um, for everybody who doesn't know, uh, this weekend actually is Global Breaks Festival, and I believe it's Saturday and Sunday. Is that correct? Yeah, so April 2nd, 3rd, Saturday, Sunday. So people tuning in um, will get to enjoy. I want to give shout outs to all the ones that are on there. Audio Trap, Dan Stash, Don Perrion, uh, let's see, DJ 30A, Brisk, DJ Shallon, Chris Craze, Doc Rock, Chris King, Maculate, Meows, Miss Ninja, Jeanette Slack, Thug Shells, Club Unity, Music Is My Medicine, uh, DJ Sidario, Colonel MC, Heather Collins, Kid Panel, Just Rob, Sabrina Rocks, uh, Paul Santana, Kid Kenobi, Hexadecimal, Mondo, Kid Breaks, and hopefully I didn't leave anybody out. I, I left myself out, but that's okay. Dang, dude. If you just did that from memory, I'm telling you, I'm impressed. Wow. I've seen the flyer. There's so many people on there. It's going to be an awesome show. So um, I got to give a shout out, too, to the GBF crew. So recently, I... Um, they interviewed me actually for the marketing director position that they had vacant, I guess. So I know Rob Williams and uh, he kind of recommended me. So I interviewed with Scott and them and they kind of were like asking me a bunch of questions. So I accepted a position. So as of like two weeks ago, I have the marketing director of the global break festival to kind of help out with driving the social media and the marketing efforts to kind of expand the brand and get more people involved in it. So thanks, Rob Williams. Appreciate that. He made this happen. So uh, he's the man and everybody else at the GBF crew. It's cool getting to know everybody. Uh, one thing that I did not know, and I'm sure you can speak to this, is how much work it takes to put together one of those shows. Yeah, so Scott, GBF, and then Scott, um, his crew which hopefully you'll be a part of definitely just rob heather collins and he has so many other people and uh without that you know things like this would be impossible so for each sunday kaleidoscope sunday sessions want to give a big shout out again like you did to just rob behind the scenes just very instrumental on uh putting things together and just being a great help and you know without his efforts you know a lot of this definitely wouldn't be happening or it'd be happening in a smaller scale so you know, all of his efforts have really uh, made things bigger for both GBF, Kaleidoscope. You know, and it's just that teamwork that we have behind the scenes that really makes it work. Um, and the great communication with all the parties um, and the DJs and behind the scenes, what people don't see is, you know, that we all do um, get along. We're all great together. We all work together. We all want to see each other do well. And I wish more of that would be relayed to everyone else. So everything's like we we love it you know behind the scenes enjoy what we do and we're having a great time so gbf presents kaleidoscope music april 2nd april 3rd um a lot of work a lot of time but it's what we enjoy so it's it's easy for us yep that's it man do it for the love that's it you know that's that's what it's about and and it takes a ton of work to make this happen like what i didn't realize when i was uh interviewing for the job that I was signing off for basically an unpaid part-time job, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Rob, you know, I joke with Rob that, you know, there is a lot of behind the scenes, what I call charity work. It, it really is. It's just, you know, I wish again, people would see just how much free time, you know, we give. And again, we wouldn't be doing it if we didn't really enjoy, you know, doing this. I'm not complaining if I, 
I hope I don't sound like I'm no, complaining. No, no, it's the truth, dude. It's just the uh, truth. It just takes a lot of work. You know, it's like setting everything up, booking all the people, getting the schedules together, getting the graphics together, setting things up like this, and then on the day of the show. I mean, it's just like throwing a regular event, an in-person event. It just happens to be on the damn internet. That's it. Yeah, yeah. No, we love it. We love it. No, we have it in either way. I know. I, I I love it too, man. I enjoy well, it. Well, unless so. it's uh, beautiful outside, then I'm going to have to stop my charity work and go with my wife to the lake and go on the Wave Runners and have a fun, you know, outside day. But yeah. So you're in if Georgia, bad, right? Makes it Are you in Georgia? Yeah, yeah, okay. Georgia. Okay, cool. So we go to uh, Lake Lanier, Lake Alatoona, and then our really nice trips, we go further north to Lake Jocassi, Lake Kiwi and lake hartwell so I think we, we mark bell's it. up there right isn't mark bell in georgia yeah so he's in athens and ironically i play at the club that's located right next to him so he's got the 90s club yeah and then i play at 1785 right right next door okay all right i didn't i didn't know that but i knew that he had that 90s club because I, I had done a podcast with him and he was telling me about it. and i'm like i'm like all right man i'm like so do you have like DJs coming in and play and stuff? He's like, no. He's like, we don't have no DJs. He's like, it's a bar with a bunch of 90s posters and stuff on the wall. And he's like, the college kids come in and like, we play 90s music and they come in and have some drinks and stuff. He's like, it's not like an actual like 90s club kind of thing. So what's the yeah. place where you, where you play called? So 1785, it was okay. called Jersey's before. And then prior to that, I was at a place called Hedges. And um, Hedges was like an old opera theater. So it, it was cool on, on stage, huge screen behind me, and then moved over to 1785, which is uh, bigger in size, but not in height, volume. Um, and we're expanding the, the uh, restaurant next to us. We're uh, in the process of remodeling into a club, and then we're demoing the wall between them so normally we do, I mean, normally between 1,500 and 2,500, and that's just going to expand. So we'll be at like two to 3,000, hopefully by wow. Christmas time. So that's a real club. Yeah, yeah. And that's every Saturday. So, wow. And then Fridays I do in Atlanta and um, not that many people, but, you know, it's, it's fun. My Friday night spot I've been for 12 years and Saturday – now um, in Athens, almost five or six years. Wow, dang, man, that's, I didn't know that. I have seen some of your pictures, like from, uh, I don't know what club it was, but the pictures you had posted when you were playing, and I was like, that looks like a lot of people, but Jesus, man, that's crazy. Um, so is it, are you doing open format or is it an EDM club? Yeah, all open format. So okay. from um, hip hop originals to hip hop, turn in the trap to twerk to original, hip hop at that 100 BPM, uh, then ramp it up later in the night to straight up EDM bangers, um, everything, everything goes, um, even, you know, throwbacks, some nineties, you know, rock songs. It's, it's a full, um, it, I mean, with two to 2,500 kids, it's right. It gets crazy in there. You know, I and bet, the dude. Songs are great. You have like everybody, you know, singing along together and the, it, it's fun. It's a lot of fun. I yeah. really enjoy it. Do you play the whole night or do you have somebody else that opens for you? Yeah, the whole night. So 10 to 210. Okay. That's not that bad. Okay. It's not that cool. bad. Yeah. I, um, I went to, I mean, I know that, you know, uh, Mondo, I went to Las Vegas like two weeks ago and went to his club, Omnia. Have you yeah. ever been there? Yeah, we did our wedding uh, in Las Vegas, and Manu and Felicia were really great hosts. Uh, we went to Omnia, and to our surprise, they had our wedding photos on these big, like, these white transparent sheets. They were hung in the club, and it was our yes. wedding photos. Yes, I saw them. I saw them come yeah. down from the ceiling. Yeah, They're like so some kind of cloth, and they project onto them, like, different logos and stuff. Yeah. Yeah, so Felicia did that for us, and uh, Mondo had us in this booth right behind him, and, like, the amount of money they get for this booth is outrageous, and, you know, for him to go out of his way to do that, so big props to both of them, and when Felicia had the video or the photos up, 
you know, I said to Ashley, my, my wife, I'm like, check it out, check it out. And she's like, what, what? And I'm like, you haven't noticed yet. She's like, Oh my gosh. That's you know? awesome, man. So the reaction, you know, from both of us was, was awesome. Like really, really great. Great, the, great hosts, great friends. The chandelier thing in there. Yeah, dude, I was like, what am I looking at, man? Like, I've never I, I've been to Las Vegas twice, never went into any of the techno club zones. So I hit him up on Twitch. I bought some records from him and um, I hit him up I'm like, dude, I'm coming to Vegas, man. I'm like, what what uh, club should I go to and where are you playing? And he told me he's like, Omni is the best club. He's like, I'll put you on the VIP list. He's like, show up uh, Friday night. So, dude, we went there after going to uh, one of the Cirque du Soleil shows, or however you say that. And uh, yeah, I always have an issue with that too. I don't know. I don't know how to like, say it. Like Cirque du Soleil. Yeah, yeah like, Cirque du Soleil. Yeah. I don't even know. Um, and dude, there was probably five hundred people in line to get into the club. The whole first floor of Caesars, right outside the club, was completely packed with people, like it was the club, and they were just waiting to get in. And so we like, he's like, make sure you go to this table, the table line, don't go to the VIP line. Went up there, boom, told him what's up. They let us in. And dude, I was just shocked at that place. Like, I was like, man, this is insane. And it got so packed in there that we just left. Like, we couldn't even yeah. get down to the dance floor because my girlfriend has never been to a techno club. So I was like, this is the one. I'm like, this is, you got to go one time, check it out. And, uh, we, we went up to the tariff. We tried to go back downstairs to get on, get an actual pit. And dude, we, it was so, it was so packed with people back to the entrance. We couldn't even walk down there to get it. So get in. It was crazy. So yeah, yeah we're man. The, uh, we were in that booth and uh, Manu brings a, uh, like a, I don't know, a big, big bucket of, you know, he drinks Corona lights. So, so next thing I know, we have a few uh, other people joining us. And, uh, and I made the mistake, you know, you're out on the lake and what do you do when you finish your bottle? You put it back upside down, you know, uh, you know, the, the empty bottle and nobody saw me though, but then, you know, I'm looking and, you know, somebody else in the, uh, in the booth goes and grabs the bottle and gives that stinky look like, uh, and I'm like, Oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> was it me, dude? I don't know what you're talking was about. It me? Was it me? <laughs> Oh well, That's no! Awesome. It's such a great, such a great time. That chandelier when it drops is amazing, dude. I was like blown away. So anybody who gets a chance, if you got to Las Vegas, even if you got to wait in line, it's worth it. It is, yeah. it is insane. That's a, I mean, that's the best club I've ever been to, and I not like I've been to a million of them, but definitely the technology that's in there is just incredible. Yeah, just I wouldn't even know how many millions of dollars they put into that. Right, right, yeah, that rig is is amazing. Yeah. So, all right, man, we'll, we'll, we'll segue into what we actually came here to talk about since we went off on that little rant. But uh, so Kaleidoscope music, man. So that's uh, that's what this is about this weekend, you know, the Kaleidoscope uh, label. So what I would like to uh, actually, you know what? Scratch that. We need to go back to your origin story. So Huda Hootia origin story. So tell us about how you got started. I'm really interested in the name. So I definitely want you to cover that. And uh, just kind of give us your, your background and tell us how you got started. Yeah, so starting with the name, like what you said, Huda Hudia or Huda Hudia, um, <laughs> it's basically the story of my life. So my last name is, uh, or my heritage is from Spain and first generation American and 99% uh, Basque, which is the northern region of Spain. Uh, and my parents met at LSU. The last name uh, is Hora Huria. So it's, you see on Facebook, Dan Georgia. Um, so being first generation in, in America, you know, nobody ever saw a Spanish last name. So the J's are H's and the Hora Huria comes from the correct pronunciation and then the mispronunciation from all of my friends. So what had happened was I started DJing uh, and I used Dan Georgia or Hora Huria and one of my friends, came in the booth and he's like, Huda Huda! <laughs> he's also a surf buddy of mine. And my surf days, when you see a set coming in, you you howl like an owl, so you hoot. And uh, all my friends used to say, instead of the hoot hoot, they'd go Huda Huda. And okay. so I kind of carried from the surf days to mispronunciation to all that. And uh, it just stuck. So Huda Huda is, 
you know, everybody can pronounce it, you know, almost you got Huda Hootie and Huda Hootia. Yeah. <laughs> dude, that was one of the great, uh, one of my great life's mysteries, dude. It's like where that name came from. Cause it's so unique, you know, like that's just like completely different than what everybody else tries to do. They come up with like words that mean something else, you know, stuff like that. Yours is actually something very unique. So that's cool. All right. Well, I can check have, that off uh, my list. Well, in the uh, cosmetics for my wife, now she uses my products, you know, Huda Beauty. <laughs> oh my gosh when that came out you know everybody was texting me like who the beauty what and it's like man i wish i was making all that money from that you know dude that's and awesome all right so then now we'll we'll segue into kaleidoscope so i mean dude one of the you know trademark breaks labels i mean everything from not only the releases but the de design language of the artwork you know the color scheme the the figures which i actually want to i want to i want you to tell us about those as well so you know how did uh how did kaleidoscope come to be and you know what's the story behind that yeah so i started djing in 1990 and it was the summer break going into senior year and my brother two years older than me so back then to get in the clubs you only had to be 18 and you obviously got a wristband if you were 21. Uh, so I was 17 and my brother's friends that summer wanted to go out to a, a can I say a bad word or no on this? Yeah, case. go for it, dude. I, I'm surprised oh I haven't cussed yet. Uh, I know, I, I'm not really <laughs> good at cussing, but no, it's shithole dive bar. Oh yeah. And, yeah, so we go there and I use my brother's fake ID and their their big thing to get in there was uh, underage drinking. You know, it was the, the <laughs> shit dive bar that you could actually drink with a fake ID. Right. So we're in there and mind you, I brought up surfing. So prior to that, I'd been surfing, geez, a long time, four or five years. And the surf trip was two hours long. So I had just a ton of CDs in my collection. And uh, obviously I drove, I was the young one, wasn't gonna be drinking. And uh, Stuart and Robert were the two friends that I was with and they knew the bartender. Bartender said, the DJ's not here. Stuart was the one with the idea. Let's grab Dan CDs and go in the booth and play. Um, so I'm like, all right, whatever. So we're just up there clowning around, putting CDs in, not knowing how to work the equipment, um, just hitting play. and. You know, the bartender's like, you know, we actually had a good time. Can you guys come back next week? And obviously we worked in a, I think like a $50 bar tab. So we were coming in there each week for a $50 bar tab, having the time of our lives. They left the college and I was like, you know what? I'm going to keep doing it. So I would, was underage doing it for a uh, $50 bar tab. It was great. Uh -huh. I mean, what other high school kid, you know, could go out somewhere and, and drink at a club and right and dj at underage <laughs> yeah. I, I wouldn't call it djing back then it was more hitting play <laughs> right right the skills hadn't hadn't come you know right. and then of course uh getting the first 1200s uh and and completely pissing off my parents and my neighbors because then came the huge clip speakers that i had in the bedroom and the practicing and and all that came with it so um they left to college i continued doing it and then let's see that was uh 91 and then this was in tampa college. was this in tampa this was in tampa okay okay uh so graduated in tampa at uh, gaither then went to usf and um during my tenure at usf um i got a well i got a bs business administration majored in marketing which you know you see that in the the label and all the art and you know, the presentation. Uh, during that okay. tenure at USF, I was um, playing on a keyboard, a Kurzweil K2500, also practicing the DJing. Actually, at that time, getting legitimate uh, DJ gigs, um, playing at, you know, venues like The Edge, you know, back in the day, day with, you know, two, 3,000 people and just having, you know, the time of my life while I'm going to school and then graduated USF 96 and then had a lot of free time from not studying and uh, started the label in 96. And our first release was with Dave London out of Orlando now, but uh, he was in Tampa with me and uh, worked with Dave for quite a while. Then uh, started working with 
DJ Volume and DJ Fix and DJ Who. And those were the, uh, the main crew for Kaleidoscope for quite a while. Uh, even Polly would come over to the house. I had him, uh, let's see. Well, I was the first label to have him. And we worked together for three years, nine to five, produced a ton of tracks under multiple aliases. Uh, and then from there, um, started working a few with DJ Hero, and then to present day, a lot of work with DJ 30A, and let's see, work with Ultimix and Funky Mix. So I've got that uh, for two official remixes a month for all the major labels, and then also the work with DJ 30A right now, and Kaleidoscope Music, Sunday Session, so it's a full... Yeah, dude. Damn. <laughs> Yeah, that sounds like a lot. So when you when you guys started, well, when you started Kaleidoscope, did you have, since you had, you know, went to school, you know, for business and you kind of had maybe like some formal training and instruction, did you have like a vision for what you were trying to do with the label at the time and like, you know, what you're, you had some goals and things like you were trying to like grow it or like did you just have, or were you just kind of like, we're putting out music, this is what we like. I mean, what was actually like the the motivations there? Uh, I think for me, it was, you know, I want to make this work and, and I don't want to get the quote unquote real job. Uh, right. Cause by then, you know, I, I knew what I loved. I, I, you know, at geez, at 17, 18, a lot of people don't really know what they want to devote their lives and careers to. And by 17, 18, I already knew this is what, you know, I wanted to do. Um, so it was a passion I, I've always had and still have to this day. And um, I wanted to make it as successful as possible. There was no uh, manual. There was no YouTube video. Even mm -hmm. making music back then, you had to rely on your, your social network of friends um, to get little tips. You had to actually read the manual, um, spend hours and hours in the studio figuring things out. You know, now it's so much easier. I, I even look at YouTube, man, I forgot how to do this. I type it up. And in two minutes, I I've, I've learned it where mm -hmm. back then it took two, three hours, you know, even making a song would take a month. Whereas now it might take one day, you know, right. it, should, it might take four hours. It's like being in the matrix, dude. It's like, you can get jacked in to learn something like just by watching a couple of videos and you're like, all right, I got this figured out enough to get started on it. Yeah. But back then it was, you know, the, the label was something I, I wanted it to be successful. I, I didn't want to have to, and that was the backside. I didn't want to have to get the quote unquote real job. Like this is what I wanted to do. And, and it's just that passion and, and motivation and determination, you know, to make it successful. So, um, you know, with, with your, your kind words and, you know, accolades, I, I appreciate it. You know, it's, it's been a, a driving force in my life and, you know, it will continue to be. So I do appreciate that. Oh, yeah, absolutely, man. I mean, one thing that I noticed, you know, because I'm in marketing and, and business as well, is I mean, you just had like brand consistency, you know, it's like from the beginning, is that like, you know, you had like a vision of like what it's going to look like and things like that. So that's kind of one thing I wanted to, to do a little deep dive on is these characters and I have I have a motivation for this. Um, but what's up with the little people that are like the kaleidoscope figures like what what are they so if you look at the very first release uh the junior camp and the kaleidoscope the the original original here's the original okay oh yeah i do have that one okay yep so the the label and then finding you know obviously back then uh you had the clip art so that was clip art and i wanted to keep that look like i really like the the boy girl and you know that that just looks so with the help of jay marley who uh back then was in orlando now he's in tampa um going with him and really establishing like this is the vision i want the boy the girl i just need it to look uh not so clip artish right and right. you know with his talent he was able to develop from that the characters the main characters and then from that we were able to develop multiple characters and the uh the look if if you really look at all the characters it's the eyes mm -hmm. you know and that's something that that he developed which you know 
Oh, yeah, blurry because I have the thing on. But yeah, the eyes are like, what's up? <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. so definitely, I give um, credit. The vision um, was from the clip art, and then from there, I had the vision to to see how it. And from there, Jay Marley was able to translate that to the artwork. And uh, again, big, huge, you know, props to Jay Marley. You know, and and countless of hours we spent, and countless of hours he spent with the uh, design work that, you know, today you look at and it's still like, whoa, you know? Right, it's classic, like timeless, you know? It's not, yeah. It doesn't look outdated. Uh, so I'm looking at one of the sleeves on the back. Yeah, you know, there's a, an email address on here and a website and then there's a phone number. And if I had my phone available, I would call it and see if somebody picked <laughs> up. <laughs> Probably, uh, Marley like did it, yeah. Seven. Yeah, so, okay, so do the people have names? Well, like the characters yeah like i like okay this is i'll tell you what my impression of them is is like um you give djs when they maybe release a track or something like that on classic you give them their own character right yes okay so yes. let me tell you about why i brought this up so you know audio bots chris and brett yes so i introduced them they were like mutual friends of mine that i introduced and they started making music and i remember when they did their first release with you and they got the little characters, and I was so jealous. I was like, what? I was like, he gives them out to people? I'm like, I didn't know that. I thought it was just you randomly like had them. I didn't know that each little each DJ got his own little person. So I was like, damn, man. So so how does that work? So like I guess the I guess my question is so the original design. Did they have like names, you know, like you had an Adam and Eve, you know, original pair. And then like, you kind of had like uh, offshoots of that, or it was just like, there was no kind of like uh, assignment to them. And it was just like, it kind of just grew organically. And then you started giving it to DJs as they started making uh, tracks or something. Um, it kind of grew like what you're saying organically. So uh, from, from just that clip art to then modern, modernize it to, uh, what Jay Marley did. And then from there, the ideas were, wow, let's really bring this to a whole new level and create this cartoon look and have each DJ represented it, re represented in a cartoon image. Um, so like Tony Feline always used to wear a, a little visor. So he's got the little visor. That one's Tony. Let me see. Oh, this guy doesn't have a visor. I don't know if these people, they're on this one, there's two hot heads, and then there's like a female and a, a guy, and there's a DJ in the background. Yeah, so the hot heads one was uh, DJ Volume and myself. And then okay. you see like uh, Funk Junkies, that's Polly and I, DJ Fix. And uh, Polly has his own, DJ Who has his own. Let me see if I find the one that has all of them. There's one that has all of them. Let me see real quick. All right. Uh, here we go. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, all right. I have one of those sleeves. I'll have to look it up. Okay, cool. So that was Tony and I when we were the kingpins. Okay. Uh, that was DJ Volume with the headphones, uh, the hot heads. Uh, this was the the one that represented me I had the that's little, what's uh, on the back of this one i know it's probably not going to show up but this is the uh yeah it doesn't work oh well but that yeah, this, yeah. the back side of this sleeve is the big picture of has those two people and the dj and the hotheads on it yeah so even today like the gbf presents we have a few of the uh djs represented in characters like rob um, like yeah. Rob got one. I'm like, what? I'm one. like, you got one. So I'm putting in my official request. I would like one if that's possible. Okay. Okay. So, dude, that would make my life. You don't yes. even know. Yes. So okay, cool, man. I appreciate that. So uh, what about the colors? Uh, the colors, since it's kaleidoscope, so wanted to have you know full color. We uh, we were well, I. I, I always say we, cause I always think of it as a team and I don't ever like to say I, but anyway, um, you know, I was thinking kaleidoscope, full color. No one was doing the full color jackets back then. Okay. Uh, it was all just a white label and a white jacket. Mm -hmm. And basically I had to go seek out a jacket manufacturing company, uh, get, geez, I had to order 10,000 at a time just to oh. make it 
Yeah. So there was a lot of money, you know, upfront money that uh, a lot of the other labels, which I totally respect, like it, it really, I just wanted to, through the marketing, have something that, that was eye catching, something that represented, you know, not from just the jacket, but the actual label. And then if you actually pick up the vinyl, um, extra money in the, the weight of the vinyl. Okay. So it's, it's not going to be flimsy. Right. So all of that. Yeah. You can't like just shake it and have that wobble sound. It, yeah. It's solid. So when you play it, you know, the needle tracks better uh, and you, you eliminate, I mean, you can still have it warp, but you know, you really eliminate um, the possibility of it warping because uh, of the thickness of the vinyl. So uh, production costs were higher. Um, so profits were less, but it, it didn't matter. It's just, you know, I, that was the vision I had and right. Yeah. P putting out a quality product. I can, I can see that, man. I mean, I recognize that stuff just by, uh, you know, listening to the tracks, seeing the, the label that was the sleeve was like a big thing for me. I wanted to know like what the story with that was, but what you said about having to order quantity, I get that now because a lot of the slate, a lot of the records have the same sleeves on them, even though they're different releases. Like, yeah, perfect example. Of, dude, I have four records right here, different records, all the same sleeve. And I didn't even realize that until now because I was like, damn, I'm looking for one like you got behind you. These are all the same. So that makes makes perfect sense. But I mean, you definitely made the right call, man, because I mean, I don't know if there is another label that is more uh, noticeable in the break scene. I mean, anybody, you're looking at somebody's record box, dude, you can see the Kaleidoscope records without even like just from the top, you know, because of the yeah, One colors. of the coolest things, uh, which got brought up just a few months ago that I didn't know about, uh, back in the uh, Playboy Mansion days when they did the uh, the cribs, go to, you know, the other, you know, the millionaires, the famous people homes. Mm -hmm. What was that show called? MTV Cribs. MTV Cribs, yeah. Yeah, yeah. The, the Playboy Mansion one. So uh, it was brought to my attention that one of the Playmates was DJing and actually playing one of my records. And I was like, no way. You know, how do you even know? And you talk about, you know, the way that it looks, you know, they're playing it. And then you look at the label and you can clearly see the color label. And then you look to the back and you see my jacket, you know, right up there yep. upright. It was one of the... Uh, the all-star one. So it was the red jacket and you could totally see, Oh yeah, you know, me, Polly, fix volume and who on it. It was like, Oh my gosh, this yeah. is great. Yeah, dude, I can look right. I mean, I got a bunch of records right here uh, in a case and I can just look, I can look right now and tell which ones are the kaleidoscope. I don't know. So you did, you nailed that, man. That was, uh, yeah, that I appreciate was, that. That was Thank amazing. You. Yeah, man. Absolutely. So just uh, one thing that you may or may not know about kaleidoscope music is that as far as I can tell, you don't have a Wikipedia. Yeah, I probably don't. And I probably don't have a hoodie hoodie of Wikipedia. You probably should, though. <laughs> I mean, and the story is that is good enough. And you have made enough of a mark on the scene to where you should have uh, a Wikipedia. Because when I was doing some research on this, I was like, oh, yeah, I'm going to find out some of these answers because I'm just going to go find the Wikipedia for Kaleidoscope. And no, it's not there. So you could t we could task somebody in GBF. Oh, maybe yeah, it'll be I'll, me. I'll <laughs> I'll add it to the uh, the to do. I need to do that. Yeah, because I mean it's a lot, a lot, a lot of good information in there. So, but um, so the other uh, the so you have some offshoot, I guess, labels from Kaleidoscope. Uh, the one that I have here in front of me is Puffin. So I got a funny story about Puffin too. So okay. you know the logo is the bird smoking a joint, right? Yes. So back when I was. I don't know, a teenager or whatever. And I was looking at this, I'm like, Oh, it's a penguin smoking a joint. Okay. <laughs> I'm like, that's cool. Puffin. I got it. A bird smoking a joint. I didn't find out until probably like six or seven years later that there is a bird called puffin. And that's what this thing is, is the puffin smoking a I'm joint. And joint. I'm like, God damn, dude, I'm a freaking idiot. <laughs> so, you know, that was, that's pretty funny. But uh, so, so that what, one was, you know, was uh, yeah, that was a side project that that I, you know, I did the puffin, and um, I just thought it was hilarious. My that was the marketing, like 
have a puffin bird puffing on a spliff. Yep. Like yep. It, it's gonna be hilarious. Yep. And uh yeah, to this day I, I love it. Everybody's like, why puffin? And just yeah, well, it's a puffin bird. Puffin it's funny, puff. dude. It's funny. And if you don't get it and then you get it, it's even funnier, man. <laughs> so <laughs> it's like one of those jokes you get like five years after somebody says it, you're like, damn, that's just funny. So what were the what were the releases on that? Like was there a certain type of release that was for that label? Yeah, so what happened was the Kaleidoscope label, it was once a month. And um, again, from from school and then the shelf life, uh, you didn't want to, when a record came out, the shelf life was at least one month. So to put two records out in a month meant that you were competing with yourself. Um, so at that point, I had multiple artists and it was... There was no rhyme or reason to who got on which label because I wanted to wanted it to represent kind of, you know, everybody. Um, so with the addition of Puffin, Kaleidoscope, All Stars, and then the offshoot with Tony Feline, Uniscope, you know, at that point, you're able to get two, let's say, releases a month. Because when you're working with multiple artists, you know, you want to be able to represent them as best as you can. And if I have one release out once a month, then it's kind of like, is this label just for yourself or are you doing it for the other artists? So I never wanted to be, you know, on my own label, only pushing myself the most. So okay. that was another, you know, uh, fix to that as well, which was, okay, now with multiple labels, multiple artists, you know, it was the solution to um, having everybody represented with the release once a month. And okay. that was the, the the solution to that was the the multiple labels. OK. And so, I mean, I'm just I'm guessing here, but that it might be more likely that somebody would buy all of these rather than yes. just one of the kaleidoscopes and they're like oh there's another kaleidoscope coming out like i'm gonna skip it this time but if it's like i got a kaleidoscope i got a puff in i got a union whatever like i'm gonna get them all it's different people you know i kind of know what i'm getting but it's not going to be all just the same the same label yeah yeah and then and then you have the artists on different ones and you know sometimes uh if it if it's like a banger, it will be on the A side of, you know, there was no rhyme or reason, the kaleidoscope, the puffin, even the uniscope with Tony. Tony and I did one side, he did the other side. Um, he would have his artists also be represented on uniscope. So we would just pick a release number, let's say 135 I would do and he'd do 246. So um, he was able to do the same thing uh, represent his artists on another label other than his his union record label okay because um, you know you, you didn't want to seem like you were pushing too much music right right but then it's like you know i'm in for you know to to make money obviously to be able to sell be able to you know feed myself so it's kind of like the the shelf life of it was how do I get around that? And that was the solution. So, okay. um, and I enjoyed it. Like I said, the puffin one was definitely all me. I, I'm glad you got that five years later yeah. <laughs> back then, you know, how many times I cracked up to it. I, and every time a release came out, the bird just kept getting bigger and the joint get bigger too. Dude, the way that I found out is I was like, hi, watching the discovery channel. And they're like <laughs> filming these puffins on like the side of a mountain doing their nest. And I'm like, what? I'm like, are you serious? This is a real animal? I was just like, dude, it just blew my mind right there. That shit was so funny. So oh on, uh, on Union, so I just want to talk about the, the Union thing. So you said, so you guys would like alternate releases on union that's what you're saying so somebody would get a number and then like well yeah. shout out to yeah shout out to tony feline that's uh union records and then back then in tampa definitely hung out with him all the time so great friend and you know we decided with kaleidoscope and union we took it and made uniscope records so oh that was our okay way. I have the wrong label then. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, well, Uniscope is Tony and I, and Union okay. is his. And then that was our way of, you know, friends and, and you know, you get to communicate more. You know, now you have a project to do together True. each month. So, um, 
Uniscope. I got to put that in my notes. That's something else I had messed up. Gotcha. Okay. All right. And then where's the Uniscope one? So that one's actually, so you can see. So oh, Tony's yeah. got, you know, there's so much kaleidoscope imagery in here um, that it's, you know, here's Tony with the visor with the union. Um, Who's the girl? The girl is my wife over here. Okay. Ashley. Yeah. <laughs> but I didn't know then. Okay, gotcha. All right. Well, so, it looks actually, just like her. I know it's it's crazy. The girl was, I mean, in all honesty, the girl was just the girl in the clip art, and right, it was okay. kind of a representative. And now, you know, such a great representative over here, my wife Ashley, and it was a sign. And you know, here's the kaleidoscope girl looking like my wife. This That's is awesome. It was That's meant to be. That's awesome. So, uh, so releases like when you were, when you, did you just randomly assign tracks to be released on the different labels? Or what I'm thinking is like you're like, okay, I'm gonna put something out on Puffin. It's gonna sound different than what I'm putting out on Kaleidoscope. There was definitely a little bit of that okay. for sure. Okay. Um, so yes, and then there was also we haven't touched on two bootleg labels that I did. We'll leave those as. No, actually three, but uh, no one really knows. Some I don't know. I don't know. What, what oh my gosh. You, you open the door, dude. On, we got to walk through it. So I was on Keith's Twitch. Sorry, excuse me. On Keith's Twitch, and he played a song, and he goes, oh, my gosh, this is like a uh, bootleg icy track from back in 19. It was like 1990. I don't know. He said 98 or 99 or something. And, and I was listening. I'm like. Dude, that I actually made that. <laughs> <laughs> what track was it? That way, it, it's not the uh, your I, love. It's not. It's not the I'll not TV dot. Is it? That's not you, is it? No. Okay. No. Good. Okay. Good. All right. All yeah, right. There is. There is. Uh. Well, I'll give you one of them. Super Funk was one. Okay. And that one, yeah. So anyway, funny, funny story on that one. Okay. So. So, and then now it's like some of those bootleg ones though. I actually did full production and I'm like, geez, I wonder if I should re-release, you know, them. But anyway, dude, I mean, you one, you definitely should Two, I think with Rob doing the new label design for the GBF. Like he killed that. He, he knocked it out of the park. Yeah. Like with the, the actual record and the jacket, like yeah. I might have to, I told him, dude, I'm going to snag that. And re-release all the old stuff using the jacket you did for the oh, GBF, like dang. amazing work. Yeah, he killed it on that, man. He has been putting some time in learning, uh, I think he uses Adobe Premiere, and like, I've seen him go from just starting to now, and I, I just saw that record thing the other day, and I was like, damn, dude, that is incredible. So, yeah. That's, and that's also at the time I found out when he had his own little character, so. Oh, yes, know. yes. Yeah, yeah, that's what yes. he told me. So. I, Ashley, got, Ashley got bumped off the right-hand side, and <laughs> <laughs> Rob's Rob took your spot, Ashley, on the. <laughs> oh, is that what it was? No, he did deserves he, it. Did he make his own character? <laughs> uh, well, with my uh, nah, yes, he did. Okay, <laughs> that's what I thought. That's what I felt like he said that he made his own person, and I was like, well, I didn't know you could do that. First of all, but I'm yeah. still super jelly. Yeah, he surprised me. I'm like, oh my gosh, that's so amazing. That's so awesome. Because yeah. it, it takes a lot of time to do a little character. Um, yeah. The, I don't know. My funniest one was the Mondo one. I enjoyed that one. The Chris Craze one, I thought is is hilarious. It's got him with the mohawk. Mm. Um, Supreme one live is is a hilarious cartoon. Like you know, we have fun with it. Um, Shallon he did his own, and his is phenomenal. Um, but it's all about the eyes. You have to get the yeah. eyes right. And then you can have your your character. All right, I'll have to I'll have to consult with Rob and see see what I, I can do. So as far as uh, just touching on releases, I mean, um, on Kaleidoscope, you know, the one that I just kind of wanted to cover was like Breakdown. So mm -hmm. I mean, well, first of all, was, is that your biggest selling release on vinyl? On vinyl, yes. okay, all right. Yeah. So I think it was that one and. Uh, Drop the bass now. Okay. Um, yeah. So for vinyl days, it was come on breakdown was right at nine thousand, and drop the bass now was at eight thousand. And for back then, 
that was a lot. Um, and come on, break down the story to answer your question behind that one was, uh, I think it might have been my first solo release. Oh, okay. Actually, yeah, I think it was my first solo release. Uh, prior to that, I had been working with Dave London and Tommy Who. And I played it for Mike Nice in Sarasota. And I was, you know, you had that that first time release jitter, like, man, I'm not sure if I'm gonna release this, you know, what do you think? You know, and, and he was all about it. He was just like, if you know Mike Nice, Mike Nice, obviously he gets his name from being so nice, great guy, <laughs> you know, the nicest guy in the world. He's like, dude, are you kidding me? Of course you should release this, this, this is the shit, like, come on, what are you thinking? Oh, yeah. And of course, maybe I'm like, really? Are you sure? He's like, <laughs> you need to get this released like today. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> That's awesome. So, so, you know, had I not been in the car with him and played it and, you know, with his uh, positive feedback, who knows? It might've been a different version. I might've been sitting on it another month and, you know, it got released and ended up being the highest selling one. So for what year was that? What year was that? Um, I think that was probably 98. Okay. I, I have to look. But yeah, probably like 1998. Yeah, dude, I'll tell you something. <clears throat> like when I stream right now, <clears throat> I mostly play vinyl. I don't get the same enjoyment out of playing like digital really. And like almost every stream, somebody asked me to play that song. Oh, and that's like, awesome. I mean, dude, it is just, a, it doesn't quit. It doesn't matter if it, the new people, old people, dude, everybody wants to hear that shit. Especially if they see another Kaleidoscope record go on, they're like, Play, come on, breakdown, you know, and I'm just like, all right, man, fine, I'll do it. You know, I play it, I play that shit so much though, but it's, it, I don't know, man, there's just some songs that they're just, you know, timeless, you know, and I feel like that's definitely one of them. And, um, <clears throat> and especially but, back then, everything was all original production from the kick, the snare to like all the instruments in it. I played, um, everything you know, from start to finish. The mm -hmm. only thing that is an original are the vocal samples. Okay. Um, everything else back then, you didn't have sample packs, sample sound, sample CDs. It was a full studio. I had racks, like, here's the one of the keyboards, right. like, but the old studio was a rack of keyboards here, a rack of keyboards behind me, a rack of keyboards there, then the rack mounts. Damn. Like, it was a full on, <laughs> Like you're in space, like an astronaut, you know? Right, right. I've and seen then, pictures of like Anthony Rother's stuff. And that's what I imagine. Yeah, I, I, I have to hunt them down. Um, Ashley and I were looking at some old photos and I actually have photos of the old one. And she's like, are you kidding me? And I'm like, yeah, that's what it, it took back then. Yeah. And I brought up the, uh, this is good for producers out there, a little tip. The astronaut analogy I used, uh, I've kept throughout my entire production career where you know, you have so much equipment and you wonder how are you able to use them all? And I thought of an astronaut and I'm like, well, they have a little guidebook, a little cheat book that they refer to a reference book. You know, if you, you know, big NASA nerd, if you look at them, they're all going back to their book. So I always like, this is all my books here. And, and I always felt like, Hey, I'm an astronaut and I've got my reference tools and, you know, this is how I'm going to operate my equipment. So. Okay. Okay. I mean, you definitely have had a, um, I mean, a unique sound, I guess, that you guys put out. Like, you know what a kaleidoscope track is when somebody plays it. Like, it yeah. definitely, yeah, definitely, you guys definitely had some something going on there with the structure and the sounds that you're using and things like that. It's definitely noticeable. Yeah. And today evolved, like, it's so crazy now. Like, listening, I, um, part of what, you know, I do is, uh, you know, mentoring and we talk about like breaks and, you know, building the scene. And I had DJ meows at the house, a good, you know, young, talented DJ and going through, uh, mentoring and showing him, you know, the production and the DJing and, you know, how to, uh, have a successful career in this. And when we sat down to make the track, you know, his style is very uh, progressive breaks. And um, I, I was like, I haven't 
done that sound in a long time. I don't even know if I can. Right. You know, and it, it's it's just like, you know, you get stumped sometimes. And I was stumped and I'm like, okay, let me let me hear a few more. Let me hear a few more. And, you know, it doesn't take long. It's like, okay, 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 I got it. I remember, I remember. And, you know, we came up with the uh, collaborative track and uh, she's doing great right now. Yeah. And um, I know, met so Caleb. Because, I met yeah, him a Caleb. couple of times. He's, he's a cool guy. Yeah. And with that, obviously, give a huge shout out to uh, DJ 30A, who I've been doing collaboration tracks for the last, you know, five years. Um, so big instrumental part in the label, what it is today. And um, so, you know, the the Meows was a, a great project for me. And, um, you know, I think that he took all the advice well. And, and that's what it's about is just, you know, today it's more mentoring and, you know, getting people, um, I don't know, to, to, to see it in a, in a positive light, yeah. you know, like Let what we do and, and the time that we, we spend. Well, so let's do let's do the deep dive on it. All right. So the state of the breaks, you know, that's what I call it. So I, you know, I you've been in the scene much longer than me. I've been in the scene since like 2000 forward, you know, and I, I've done I've done parties and, you know, everything I was my I guess you could say my my role in the scene was more of um, creating platforms for the DJs to play on, you know, throwing the parties, promoting and things like that. I can DJ, but it wasn't really ever like my my thing, you know, and so I've watched the evolution of it, you know, from, you know, a perspective of not, not a producer, you know, and so what do you see about the scene right now that would, well, let me think how I want to say this. The scene has the same people in it that have been in it since the, the late nineties, early two thousands, right? You know, the demographic of the break scene is third male 35 to 45. Like that's it. And what can we do as participants in this thing to attract younger people into the scene? Because from my perspective, what I see going on is that, you know, when you go to a party, of an event, I mean, you're basically seeing the same people, you know, R rarely, if ever, have I seen, like, Caleb is like an outlier, you know, like, somehow he got, oh, I think it was because of his dad, actually. Yeah, but, Marty, but, but him is, him as well, I don't want to, yeah, but yeah. So, you know, I, what I see is that, you know, we don't have some type of feeder to bring new people into the scene. So I just want to get your opinion on what you think is going on with, like, breaks currently and, like, you know, what can be done to rejuvenate, you know, um, you know, the, the people in it to, like, so we have. So, so how many how many paragraphs do I have on this? Dude, answer? listen, <laughs> this is called, this is a deep dive, dude. I'm telling you, this to me, this is an important question. And, like, because it really is about the future of the music, you know? I think there's, like, so many bullet points on that question. So I'll stick with the, uh, the bullet points and kind of explain. Um, I'll start with, with me, and then I'll run down through everything else. So bullet point with me, what I'm done throughout my entire career is, uh, not only think about myself, but think about others. And I think that's lacking, you know, a lot of the, uh, you know, the producers in the industry, you know, which is fine, you know, there is a lot of time and I don't know, I, I think that a lot more of the producers and established producers could be doing more to lift other people other than themselves. Uh, the other part is new producers. We've had plenty of new producers, uh, Wookie, uh, let's see, Kid Panel, um, Lady Walks, uh, Big Name, Diplo's done breakbeat tracks, um, Jaws has done breakbeat tracks, Skrillex has done breakbeat tracks. And kind of what you're saying, like we've been in this scene for so long like me i'm a perfect example you know 30 years doing breaks um it, it's a name you always see you know it's like geez I, i've seen his name so many times like can we get any new people you know to headline shows can we get you know new people out there and i think it's kind of you know i am 
in a sense, part of the problem, but I'm doing the best I can to eliminate that as a problem to where, you know, I see it as I want to help and support as many new talented people out there. I want to bring them to Kaleidoscope, let them be seen, let them be shown. I've had over a hundred artists released through Kaleidoscope and, you know, it's not about the money. It's about the exposure, not for myself, but for them. And I think a lot of people could be doing more, you know, to, but I think they think that it's going to take away from what they're doing. So I can't explain, you know, other people, what they're doing. I can only do what, you know, what I do and hope it shows people there is a, there is a good route. As far as the demographics, definitely the 35 to 50 year old. And I think if we do promote this new talent, I, I feel like we lost the Wookiee. We lost the Jaws. We lost, you know, even the Diplo. We lost, you know, these, these artists who are playing main stage festival that have done breaks tracks and see it like, whoa, these, these artists are bashing the scene that, you know, they represent, you know, you see it on Facebook, like it's constant, like to, to me, it's, it's, it's gosh, like for somebody like me doing this 30 years, who's devoted my life to see other producers bashing breaks saying, you know, oh, I'm doing it and, and I hate it. And it, it's just like, well, you're bashing, you know, me who's devoted my entire life to this. You know, you're, de you're bashing other people who have devoted their entire lives just because, you know, you might not be successful. You might not be getting the recognition. Mm -hmm. Doesn't mean you go out and bash people just for 40 comments on Facebook, mm -hmm. like that sort of negativity. I don't, you know, I steer clear from, I, I don't think it's useful. Um, I think the community in itself, I, I don't understand why people like to bash it you know if people were more you know inviting and 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 i don't right. know definitely something needs to change and and the the things that i brought up like we need to be better at promoting new artists putting them you know in good time slots giving them you know the the right time to shine i think uh an outlet like twitch has really shown that you know, there are a lot of people that like breaks. You look at the numbers for the breaks DJs and they're high. I look at my numbers and D DJ 38's numbers on Spotify and TikTok. Um, I had a uh, highlight just last month. It was almost 537,000 plays in one week. And uh, DJ 30A was instrumental in that as well and his plays were right at 500,000 too and, and wow. nobody wants to recognize like whoa you have a breaks dj getting that many plays of their music like we are doing fine and and i'm doing this daily and i'm spending all my time you know either with my wife or in the studio and that's where it all goes we're out you know on the lake but you know this is my life this is my career and and i'm gonna push it and uh, I mean, you look at the Kaleidoscope Sunday sessions, bringing in new artists, featuring new talent, like uh, we have ladies night, bringing in the ladies, all the talented ladies out there, lady DJs, producers. Um, so, you know, is it, do I look at myself? Do I question, have I not done things right in, in my, my career path? And I would say, no, I've, I've always looked out for not only myself, but you know, everybody else on the label. And it goes back to what I said earlier. It's, it's my label, but I didn't want it to be known as my label. A lot of people right. didn't even know it was my label. So for me, that's yeah. success. Yeah. Um, so I, dude, that, you know what you're saying? I mean, that, that definitely sounds like you're more part of the solution to this. I mean, you have been over the, the years because you're right. I mean, you know, um, when I when I look think about what a, a possible solution is or how that would look like, I look to the drum and bass guys. Like, if you know anything about the drum and bass scene, they have a constant influx of new producers, new fans, new event, new events, you know, new festivals and things like that. And it's like, how does it? How does that happen? And it's exactly what you said. They have feeder. I mean, I don't, I don't want to call them like tubes. I don't know. Uh, they, they, they're they feeding the scene from the bottom by one. Like you're saying, like Meows, let's use him as a good example. Well, how many how many friends does he have that listen to his music, you know? Put him on the bill, then he's got his friends coming to the show. 
then he tells their friends, and then you got new people coming to the show, right? That's how you build a community, right? Is inviting people, you know? So the mentor, the mentorship or the putting people out there on the schedule, on the bill, you know, whether it's a streaming or in person, I mean, that's definitely one way to do it. And yeah, when you look at the lineups, you don't see that. You look at the no, not, I, not not the streaming lineups, but the the lineups on the events that take place in person, like in Florida, especially. You're seeing yeah, the you same people on there that's been on there for the past twenty years. You know, it's like, all right, right. and 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 like I said, I I'm throwing myself under the bus as well. I definitely don't have a problem doing that. I think you know a lot of people do, but I, you know anyway. But yeah, I've been on those bills, but behind the scenes with those promoters. I have been on every single show instrumental on saying, let's get this new talent. Let's get mm-hmm. this new talent. Um, we had the the rave uh, event, the uh, outdoor rave with, uh, with Thomas Tool Time in Orlando during COVID. Um, one person that I pushed was on the mic and I'm like, he hasn't played a show in Orlando. And, and Thomas is like, are you sure? I'm like, yeah, let's get on the mic on a bill. He's, he hasn't been on a bill. So instrumental in getting him, you know, his first show on a on a big lineup, you know, it's not only people like him, but there's multiple countless people where I'm like, we need to get him, we need to get him, we need to get him. Uh, Kid Panel, somebody out, you know, overseas, Detach, Lady Walks, like all of this international talent that mm-hmm. we're not using. The Lady Walks, you know, I was instrumental again with Thomas, like we've got to get Lady Walks over here. Like she, you know, so it's, a revitalization in Russia, Spain, uh, those demographics, I look at my what the regions where I'm hitting, it's huge, Russia yeah. and Spain. So why aren't we bringing in these Russian and Spain producers, you know, into the US? And it's, and it's the same problem, exactly what you're saying. You know, it's just the, you know, I don't want to seem like I'm bashing, but yes, the promoters bring in the same talent. It's like, it works. I don't want to take a chance. That's it. That's it. Exactly. That's it. They know who's coming, you know, but they it, know. It's, it is detrimental to yes. what you're saying and it creates a problem. And, and that's the problem. Like you see, and you know, you even said on, on your Twitch, you know, I'm, I'm trying to address that problem by bringing in, I mean, look at all the talent, look at the, all the names that last year, you you wouldn't even know right, right? like you, you put the audio know. bots on you know you put the audio bots on like they've been making music for a long ass time but they just had to get to the level where they could start putting out releases on big labels like yours and stuff and it was like damn i mean when that happened i was like wow that is amazing and yeah it was very like cool of you for, for them to be able to do that but yeah that's your like philosophy on that is yeah bring in the new people yeah it's uh you know it, it's it's all if you are able to build a group, you know, then you're just being a part of that group to me is good enough. Mm-hmm. Like, but I think other people see it as I just want to build myself. Right. Yep. You know, and that's the problem. Yep. You know, it's, it's, it's not about just you. It's about an entire genre. And again, focusing back on the Facebook and the Facebook posts, it's just so demeaning, not only to, yourself you know you look petty uh you look just it's just a terrible look for that person posting you know and it's a bad look for the entire scene do i go there and and comment i think i've only commented on on one um but it's not worth the time it's not worth what the the baiting that they're trying to do for their own proliferation of of their name like i said like the 40 comments is it is it really worth bashing career djs like myself in your post that i read and i i take offense to it Mm -hmm. and a lot of other people do as well just just leave that to yourself right you know like promote the industry as a whole why not promote Mm -hmm. like hey i i really enjoyed this record instead of saying oh this record sounds like this or this sounds like that it's like what's the purpose of that? Right. I, I don't understand it. And it's not a philosophy that I, I can connect with. And obviously you talking to me, you know, to me, it's just like watching um, Fargo. You're like, how did this guy get in so much? Like he keeps fucking up. You know, it's like, <laughs> like who, why would you even make that first mistake? You know, it's right. like watching Fargo. It's like the train wrecks of these DJs 
putting shit on Facebook that just doesn't need to be there. Yeah. No, I mean, the Facebook thing is a huge, just a social media problem. You know, people think that it's like they're, they're like on the soapbox in their town square, you know, like shouting out their truths, you know, for everybody to hear and like that people care. Yeah. I mean, I think to, uh, to come on that, like the, yeah, the break scene has a sort of like an image problem with, and because of stuff like that, you know, it's like when I think about, um, if I'm going to try to find, you know, out about breaks, like, what am I going to see out there? You know, and you're going to see a lot of comments and things like that. You're going to see, uh, you know, I think that some of the flyer design and stuff like that is kind of old. And like, we, you know, I, I look at like Anjuna deep as like a comparison, you know, like if you look at like the stuff that they're doing, it's like, they kind of get it, you know, their Facebook page has 500,000 subscribers. I mean, not Facebook, their YouTube channel has 500,000 subscribers. You know, it's like they're doing something. And if you look at look at just their the look of, of the music they're putting out, you can see like, OK, you know, we don't have we don't have that, you know, kind of like the kaleidoscope thing. Like you have a look and a brand and things like this. The break scene, we don't have some kind of cohesive message, you know, about the music and about what we stand for and, like, why you should want to be involved in this. Because I remember, man, breaks used to have stages at Ultra, you know? Yeah. It's like, what the hell happened to that? You know, yeah. it's like, it used to be that big where you could go to one of the biggest music festivals in the world and hear the biggest breaks artists. And then, yeah, which ties in, well, I'm glad you said that. So, uh, always give the, the proper kudos. Robbie, DJ Robbie. Uh, instrumental with bringing the breaks back to EDC. So For that, shout out to so Rob. Shout out to Rob. Uh, the Robbie. <laughs> Just Rob. We already gave you some. Oh shout yeah, outs. yeah, not that guy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, no, so Robbie, huge instrumental with um, with bringing breaks to EDC. We had the um, art car in 2019, and it really showed um, that that breaks is viable to a festival um we had you know the the younger kids you know i call them mm -hmm. uh in front of the stage we had an amazing time and then obviously covid and everything got pushed back a year and then last year we had edc and they gave us the rhino car a bigger area and next year we'll have a well i can't say what we will have but um anyway again with with robbie instrumental getting um, I'll just at least say a new uh, car for us. Okay. Um, and with that, um, you know, uh, Robbie and I, great friends and, and been able through the last three, four years, I've known him 30 plus years. Um, he values, you know, not only what I say, but you know, what my wife says and um, our opinions and you'll see in, you know, the lineups, definitely what we're trying to achieve, which is bring in, uh, new talent each year um, stick with just a very very small core um, big shout out to Heather Collins as well for all the work she does behind the scenes mm -hmm. uh, with that but you know behind the scenes you know I, I really wish you know people could see it. and I go back very quickly to the Facebook the negativity like I don't see that and it for me it's just hard because what I do see is all the positivity that you know, is in my life and the people that I talk to just with Robbie, Heather Collins, just Rob, Scott at uh, GBF, you know, DJ Mondo, DJ 38, Doc Rock, like I could just keep naming all these DJs. And for me, you know, I look at it like you look at the, the state of politics, which is 50 percent, 50 percent, you know, and you think, well, in how I'm doing and I'm a numbers guy, obviously, you know, and it's like, well, I'm at least doing. 99 percent you know right. positive like i have all the people that i talk to there's one or two people yeah i don't agree with you're not going to agree with everybody but it's not 50 percent you know for me it's like you know just gosh i could put on two fingers you know right. people that i don't agree with so right. i'm doing great like the break yeah. scene <laughs> behind the scene is doing great like what you said, the time, you know, the the charity work, the devotion that, you know, the people that I surround myself with, you know, they understand it. And those are the people that, you know, are pushing the scene in a positive way. Mm -hmm. Like there are people I don't want to focus on 
you know, and I, I'm not naming any of the negative. There's no reason why I would ever, you know, the positive people, the Rob E, the Just Rob, the GBF, the Heather Collins, even new to the scene, the Thug Shells, Chris Craze with Twitch Mob, you know, uh, DJ 38 I produce with, Dan Stash, who we've got to cross over from open format to play breaks, Don Perrion, like you'll see them all at GBF, Kid Panel. Like we're really trying to introduce, you know, a global um array of of talent and mm -hmm. and again i'm i'm harping there are so many more of us that see that and and i don't understand why everybody focuses i guess because it's good i mean i even read it it's right it's, it's clickbait man it. yeah. It yeah. yeah and it's yeah. like holy shit yeah. did you yeah. see what this person said yes that's yeah, it and it's man. funny it's easy way to get attention like, yeah but no, you're like, you're like, no, I can tell you without question, 99% of what I do is positive and 99% of the people that I talk to and surround myself with are all positive. We all laugh behind the scenes. We definitely don't comment on that shit because yeah. definitely yeah. not what we do. Don't put your foot in that shit for real. Yeah, yeah no, but some of them are pretty damn funny. Yeah. Like, yeah, anyway. So, I mean, I, I definitely, I, li I like your answer. I mean, I, I, like I said, this is a question I ask everybody that I do the podcast with, because to me, it's just, it's very important because of just me seeing, you know, like how much longer are you going to be making music? You know, what happens when Huda Hootia leaves the scene? Like then what happens to the music? It's like, so. Well, that's there's... also, that's really also part of it. Like um, one of the producers out there, uh, DJ Shallon, you know, very talented producer mm -hmm. and um, does great music. And, you know, that that question right there, how much longer am I going to be doing this? And, you know, I'm like, Shallon, look, let's I, I know what I can bring to the table as far as exposure for you. Um, let's let's do releases for a year on Kaleidoscope. I'm going to help you build that exposure as best as I can. And then throughout that year, I'm going to be instrumental with you on making sure you get the right distributors, making sure you get your own label design. And by that end of the year, you know, establish yourself with your own label and stand on, you know, your two feet, because right. that's what I want to see. And, and that's where I think you said questions to the other DJs producers. I think it's more of ask them, what have you done for the scene? And that's a question I ask myself every day, you know, and, and I want to make sure I've done the most that I can, because if I don't, then I'm not going to sleep at night. Right. And again, there's only out of a hundred people, two people I don't get along with. I'm doing great. Like, right, right. like who else can say that? Yeah. Like, yeah. What have you done for the scene, man? I mean, that's it. Like, you know, in business, this is called secession planning. <laughs> you know, you know what I'm saying? Like, we got to figure out what the hell is going to be happening in 10 years when, you know, like, like you, see that. you see this with the GBF presents, like how many names are we bringing? And, and it's because, yes, I don't want to be pigeonholed in already. I, I downplayed myself, too. And it's I'm part of that. 30 years of headlining flyers. Oh, I'm going to go see this guy again. You know, luckily, um, I do have a great following. I've represented myself well for 30 years, you know, and, and all of the people that come and see me, I go and interact with every single one of them. I know at least 200 names every time I go, you know, and I spend the time because, you know, I do truly appreciate it, you know, and a lot That's of people awesome. just feel like, you know, I'm just this personality and I'm going to stay behind the curtain. And I, I don't see the sense in that either. It's like they came out and they put money to come see you. And right. they're the reason you're on stage and you're not going to give them the time and the, the courtesy to say hello and thank you. Right, right. And they bought your music over the years and been, you know, huge fans basically supported your career. Yeah, I mean, definitely, you know, fans love... Uh, they love that stuff. So, all right. So the next thing is just, you know, the streaming, you know, so streaming has just like, if I, if I, at one point I thought the break scene was dying out, streaming has made me rethink that. And I mean, like the, the community, even though it's the same demographic, but the community is like, out there in full force watching the shows checking out the streams i mean ever since the migration over to twitch happened it's been like wow you know what's what's happened so 
Uh, well, I just want what is, what is your take on just the whole streaming scene as like to how it's affected the music and like what you think is going on with it as far as just how it's affected the state of the breaks. Um, well, I'll do the first one. For me, it's like what we've talked about. It's been amazing because I do take everything that you said and and again find solutions for that. And that's Twitch for me has been able to answer that long time problem of breaks. Uh, so you have the promoters out there that we know bring the same talent, the same lineups, you know, and I'm a part of it. Thank you. I appreciate, you know, being part of that, the same lineups, but in the same sense to build. So for me, Twitch, I've been able to do the promoter side of it, which is everything that we talked about. So I won't harp on and reiterate everything that right. I said. Uh, the next thing is, with Twitch establishing the new talent. Like there's so many uh, new DJs that we see, even you look at the lineup for GBF and it's like, I don't know these people. And it's like, well, you should, they're really talented. They're really good. And you know, it's bringing in this new talent, this new influx of not only viewers, but DJs. So for me, I look at it as a positive. It's growing, it's building. Um, that you still have, you know, the little pockets of negativity, but I look at it as the whole and to have so much of an increase, uh, so many more viewers, um, the, the fans, like I want to give a huge shout out. And even on my streams, I, you know, I see the ones that not only tip me, but also were in other people's streams and, you know, they're tipping them as well. And it's, again, it's not, you hear me, it's not about me. You know, it's about everybody. So even on my streams, I'm like, thank you not only for supporting me, but for supporting all of the other DJs. And I, you know, there are plenty of them that I see and I know their names. And I'm like, I, I've seen you in, you know, such and such channel. And, you know, I know they appreciate it. And we truly appreciate you guys. And that's the other thing, too. It's like none of these people watching have to tip you. Right. Like, right. you know, and they're doing that out of their their the kindness of their heart. So, mm -hmm. you know, you really have to thank them, make sure they know, like, we really appreciate this, you know, and for the ones that are doing that for all the DJs, those are the stand standouts. And it's like, you know, thank you. Thank you. And, and it's, it's just being a decent human being, you know, and I think, you know, some people just lose track, like, you know, there, there are, but again, it not focus on them. The majority of us, you know, stick with the decent human being yeah. philosophy I, dude, i'm right there with you man like what you were talking about with you know the behind the scenes and the working and stuff like everybody that i work with is like we're super pumped you know yeah all the yeah. time all the time like you know it's it's like this is fun you know this is like what we love to do if there's not like you know negative nancy's in there you know do it like saying stuff you know on the sly you know whatever so i'm right there with yeah, you and, but, and for us to, to add to that like for us just so all the viewers know like the actual time we spend on that negativity it's hey you know I'll, I'll say rob just rob i talk to him all the time rob did you see that post yeah right omg yep okay next moving like, on literally that's how much time we spend on it and it's yeah. like okay we have so much better things to do and talk about than For that sure. but, you know you were like, yep, OMG, oh my gosh, yeah. can't believe that, okay, next. Yeah. Yeah. Like, literally, that's, we're done. Yeah, that's it, move on. I mean, that's, yeah, when you live your life in the positive, you know, you're going to be focusing on that, not the negative. But for the streaming, man, I'm right there with you, like, net positive for the scene. I mean, like, I think it's great. it has done, it has revitalized it in a sense. Um, yeah, introduce new people, I mean, a lot of people, which is hilarious, you know, they still have this, the mix CDs from a long time ago. So they're like, play this song from this mix CD, you know, and it's like, they, so it gives them a chance to hear the music again, you know, because there's always the old school uh, sessions and stuff like that in the vinyl sessions. So, yeah, I, uh, I'm definitely looking forward to being involved with GBF and like what they're doing, because I mean, I feel like they're definitely pushing the streaming scene forward in a positive way you know just like kind of we're talking about with a, with the in the real world you know like somebody spearheading that and i think gbf is definitely doing that on the on the streaming front you know so it's definitely yeah when i first 
got on the Twitch, it was, you know, Scott reaching out and, you know, hey, do you want to be a part of GBF and me not knowing, you know, what what he was doing and mm -hmm. you, you know, somebody so again, you know, positive positivity. It's of course, I'm going to be drawn to Scott, you know, we yeah. talk behind the scenes. It's like, geez, if you were my neighbor, you'd be over here every day. I know. Like, He's super just, cool, man. He's yeah. Super cool. It's like, wow. And the vision that he had with the, or has with the global breaks festival and, you know, making it global aligns with, you know, what I'm doing. And, and that's, that's where, you know, to harp on, like, like that's if you don't know what to do, how can I contribute? Align yourself with people that are contributing. Right, that. And you know, our time again, my time is valuable. And again, I, I'll apologize to I get reached out to or by multiple artists, multiple people. Like it's it's time consuming and and I apologize. I'm not able to spend all that time, but you know, they might look at that as a negative, but it's like behind the scenes, I spend a lot of time doing, you know, as much as I can. And does it alienate some people? Not by choice. It's like, you know, this GBF, it's it's taken up. Yeah, it's a monster. Of our time, it's a monster, you know? dude. I didn't realize it. Like I said before, I didn't realize how much time it went into one of these events. But yeah, it is a monster. I have um, paid remixes that I had to push back. You know, so it's like, you know, I, I could be getting paid for that time, but I'm doing this to, you know, promote everybody. It's it's the bigger picture. Again, it's not about me. It's about what can I do for the group. Right. And I'll tell you right there, man, I think that's a good closing point, you know, and like, it's not, it's not just us, everybody, you know, like, I'm not, I know that I'm not the only person that sees this. You're not the only person that sees these things going on. It's like, what can we all do to be more inclusive, mentor people, bring people into the scene? That way it can just grow. Because, you know, yeah, dude, you only need like one or two people to do something that could like change it. You know, you just got to get some new people in with some new thoughts. They put out some tracks. One of them goes fucking viral on TikTok or something, you know? It's like, dude, you know, we just got to have those people, you know, we have to have the scene open to accept that kind of stuff, you know? So... That's it, man. What have you done for the scene? So I'm, I'm ready to wrap it up, dude. I'll hit that wrap it up box right now, man. Uh, uh, do a few shout outs. We'll do the, uh, the GBF and then some shout outs mixed in. So obviously GBF, April 2nd, 3rd, Audio Trap, Dan Stash, Don Perrion, DJ Shallon, uh, DJ 30A, Brisk, Miss Ninja, Meows, Maculate, uh, Doc Rock, Chris... Craze, DJ Mono, Paul Santana, Sabrina Rocks, DJ Sidario, Club Unity, Jeanette Slack, Thug Shells, Music is My Medicine for Life, Colonel MC, Kid Panel, Kid Kenobi, Kid Breaks, Hexadecimal, Just Rob Official, Heather Collins, and myself. And also a big shout out to Rob Analyze, Mark V, uh, obviously my co-producer the last, geez, three to five years, uh, DJ 30A. Also want to give a huge shout out to my lovely wife, Ashley. She's the, I don't She's the blonde. Up. She's the blonde on all of the lay, all of the record sleeves. Uh, I gotta, I gotta get myself together here so I can finish my shout out. No, just behind the scenes. So instrumental, even with the Twitch and the support and the love, you know, that I get from her is amazing. So without her, you know, Ah, wouldn't be, it wouldn't be up. happening. Who da who I, I gotta yeah, stop, yeah, otherwise yeah. I'm gonna tear up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I want to give some shout outs too, man. I mean, just to uh, you, especially for taking the time to do this, dude. You don't even really know how this is like a milestone in my uh, breaks career. So I definitely appreciate you taking the time out to do this. Shout out to your wife for letting you do this, coming through with the assist. <laughs> appreciate that. And um, shout out to Rob and everybody at Global Breaks Festival and then everybody who's in the streaming community who's checking us out. Uh, you can find uh, Huda Hudia or Huda Hudia, as people in the Far East call him, at twitch.tv slash DJ Huda Hudia, which is actually under your uh, camera on here when you see it. And then you can find Mixed Days, which is my channel, uh, which I do podcast and, you know, live streams at youtube.com slash Mixed Days. And so we'll have the full version of this up on there. And then for Global Breaks Fest, we'll have the uh, the talking about the Kaleidoscope music and kind of the condensed version for that. So with that said, man, closing remarks. 
Thank you for all you do and truly appreciate it. So thank you. I've had a wonderful time. All right, man. So I appreciate it and we will talk soon.